You guys are now live. Thank you. Good evening, Mono County, and welcome to the COVID Community Conversation for November 19th, 2020. My name is Brian Wheeler from Mono County Public Health. And again, joined by many panelists from around the county. Um, there have been a lot of changes and a lot of things have happened since we last were together two weeks ago. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So we're gonna push right ahead and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Stu so he can do the uh, presentation for the opening. Stu. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for all the panelists for joining us again. We'll get through uh, a pretty um, beefy update um, and then we'll get to your many questions, I'm sure, about our status and changes and where we are with the metrics. Um, we hope the presentation will provide you with sufficient information uh, this evening. It does change frequently. We're doing the best we can to update the portal and our website metrics, so bear with us. Um, but we'll update you with what we have this evening. Um, first of all, we wanted to um, just take a little bit of time and reach out to the community of Walker, who, um, as we all know, were devastated by the Mountain View fire on Tuesday. Uh, over 20,000 acres were burnt with over 80 plus structures destroyed. That's many of our homes, businesses and ranches literally burnt to the ground in minutes. Uh, at this time, a type two interagency incident management team has assumed command of the fire with support and assistance from uh, Mona County. So this website here is our all encompassing portal. So for any information resources and soon, I know there's a lot of uh, questions. Uh, everyone wants to find out how, or find out where they can help, how they can help. Again, all this information will be available on this portal. And that is the uh, website address right there on the bottom there. So um, please take some time, um, help out our friends up in Walker um, under this really you know, tiring and de devastating situation. So thank you. So this winter, again, we need everyone's help to ensure that we are doing everything we can to stay safe, to stay open. It is more than just a hashtag. It is literally a way of life. We wanted to remind you that um, no indoor gatherings are currently permitted in Mono County. They're only permitted if we're outdoors. I know it's very difficult in our um, winter cold environment, but again, we have to minimize the transmission of this virus. Um, we are also uh, requiring uh, face masks worn in outdoors and in public uh, when maintaining a physical distance of six feet from persons who are not members of your household unit. On the right side there of the slide, you can see our new winter, stay safe to stay open flyer. That's gonna be distributed throughout town on our social channel, channels. It'll be in our bus shelters. It'll be on our notice boards. We want this kind of everywhere throughout the town of Mount of Flakes and the entire county um, as we move into Thanksgiving weekend. So uh, please help us stay safe to stay open. Just want to spend a few slides looking at our metrics. Uh, we had many requests, many questions on how we're doing outside of the base. So this graph is on our case stats portal. This shows you that uh, as of today, there was 259 positive cases from the base at Pickle Meadows and the county is currently 235 cases throughout the county. We've updated this slide to show uh, again, the three separate regions, but we've also included the base count. So right here, you can see 189 of those cases are in Mammoth Lakes, 259 are up in um, Pickle Meadows, 29 in North County and 17 in South and East County. And you can see, unfortunately, we uh, have an additional death from COVID-19. The 30 day metrics, this is a slide we show uh, each and every time we're with you uh, for these conversations. This is the positive number of positives per week over a 30 day period. So on the left hand slide there, you can see we've tested just under a thousand people. We had 56 positives with a 30 day positivity rate of 5.74%. And this is done by onset date, which is the orange line. So you can see the orange line has gone from five to 13 to 24 to 14. 
This is the percent positive rate by week. Again, it excludes the uh, base counts, base cases, base cast cases from Pickle Meadows. Again, this shows you the four day, sorry, the four week trend on the bottom of the slide there and the trend uh, since um, August. So you can see the last week from 8th of November to the 14th, the positivity rate was five. The week prior was just under 10. And before that was just under six. And you can see we started at 2.2 at the end of October. At this time, the hospital is still functioning in the green status. A couple of different slides here we wanna show you. This is the positivity rate um, of a 14 day period per 100,000 people. You can see the majority of cases are in Mammoth Lakes. Uh, 244 in an unincorporated Mono County uh, for a total of 272 across the county. We wanted to also show you that this is the number of uh, symptomatic people calling the 211 line. Uh, you can see there's a dramatic increase in the number of symptomatic people uh, calling um, that are symptomatic. So again, we're seeing some, well, significant community transmission of COVID-19. Blueprint for a safer economy. Um, I think we're all aware of the change. We were recently reassigned to tier two, red, or what they call the substantial category. You can see here on the right slide, the metrics used by the state um, to determine our status was an 18.4 case rate per 100,000 people with a 5.3 testing positivity rate. You can see here we are part of what they call the small county framework. So we moved recently from orange to red. So we went over the permissible 14 cases. And for us to move or to get reassigned into the purple category from red would mean that we would have to have more than 35 cases for us to move into that uh, more widespread or the most restrictive tier. So again, we need to do everything we can to stay safe, to stay open and not regress back into the purple. This just shows you a summary of what business sectors can operate in the red tier. I'm not gonna go through each and every business sector. Again, all this information is available on the Path Forward page of the Mono County portal. The uh, blueprint tier assignment is what they're calling more, more recently the uh, emergency break. So the California governor pulled the break. What does this mean? Means that tier assignments uh, can occur any day of the week. Counties um, can be moved back more than one tier and counties may move with, within one week of worsening metrics. Typically it was a two week period with the emergency break. Now it's down to one week. Couple of other changes here. Counties are required to implement sector changes the day following the tier announcement. You can see here, they talk about the adjudication requests. And then really the key messages, the reasons why this is all happening. Obviously, as we all know, we're experiencing an unprecedented rate of increase. The state's goal as it always been is not only to preserve, preserve our healthcare capacity in the state, but also Mono County. Um, and given how quickly cases are increasing, um, likely testing positivity rate, um, you can see now that 41 counties are in purple, 11 in red, four in orange, and only two in yellow. So you can see it's, it's very severe across the entire state. Uh, this bullet down here just applies to schools and what that means for our local school systems. You can kind of see those bullets there. And again, this presentation will be available on the portal after the presentation is in streaming live on the, on the Mono County uh, Public Health Facebook page. The state recently issued updated a travel advisory. Again, this is not a mandate, it's an advisory, um, really looking at limiting travel throughout the state. Again, as they know, travel and mobility is a big part of transmission. So really urging all our residents, California citizens to stay home or in their region and avoid non-essential travel. The state also issued updated guidance for gatherings. We talked about that in Stay Safe to Stay Open. 
Again, no uh, indoor gatherings permitted in Mona County. Uh, only gatherings of uh, 12 people from a maximum of three households are permitted outdoors. The state also issued updated guidance for the use of face coverings. Basically says that a face covering is required at all times when outside of the home with some exceptions and you can read through the exceptions here. The big one for Mona County is what we're really realizing is for those of you who are eating in restaurants, you have to keep that mask on unless you're actively eating and drinking. So if you're conversing with staff, if you're moving around the restaurant or moving around businesses indoors, um, you're required to keep your mask on. You can see here, it lists the exemptions from people wearing face coverings. Um, it is consistent. Again, this PowerPoint is available for review after the presentation. I just want to spend a couple of slides on the new assistant assistance program uh, or the new round two assistance program called CURE. Uh, this is from Mona County. An additional $100,000 is now available from the CARES Act funding. Round two applications are due on Tuesday, December 1st at 5 p.m. You can apply now on monocounty.ca.gov forward slash economic. And again, this is for unincorporated areas of Mona County. The town assistance program round three just concluded. Uh, town has awarded just under $300,000 of funds. These are the round three recipients listed here on the slide. At this time, there is no additional funding for this program. Again, any additional information can be found on the town's website. Mammoth Lakes Housing is still seeking donations to raise $300,000 to support much needed rent assistance payments through December. Uh, as they have raised just over 16,000, we have a way to go. So please consider donating to mammothlakeshousing.org for those in need. Thank you. Just a quick update on testing for next week. Testing at the Mona, sorry, at the Mammoth Lakes Community Center is on Monday and Wednesday. Again, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Stu, uh, Stu, can I yep. quick interrupt you? There's yes. a change in that. Yep. Um, due to uh, lab closures for the holiday, which will be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and they're not open on Sunday, um, we have changed and we will test on Tuesday. So there'll be double testing in Mammoth on Tuesday. It'll be Verily and Mono County Public Health. Great. See, I told you it was changing minute by minute. <laughs> Sorry about I, that, Stu. As soon as I, as soon as I published the, the PowerPoint, it changes. So, so Brian, uh, so we're testing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Mammoth Lakes Community Center. No, no, just Monday and Tuesday. No testing. Monday, on Tuesday, Monday. no Wednesday. Got it. Monday, Tuesday, Mammoth Lakes Community Center. Verily are also testing on Tuesday and then Friday in the Antelope Valley. Correct. Again, all this information will be on the Mono County portal. Just click on the get tested today graphic on the top of the portal. Thank you, Brian. Next community bilingual conversation is in two weeks. That'll be December 3rd at 5.30 p.m. Again, all the local information and resources that you've seen, every meeting, this is 211, Spanish, English. Our portal is English and Spanish. Our week in review is issued every Friday. But again, with Thanksgiving next week, the weekend review will be issued on Wednesday prior to Thanksgiving. Brian, with that, that ends our presentation for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Thank you for the update and all that good information. Um, I know I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there, so why don't we go ahead and, and get started with the Q&A. Brian, we're gonna start with callers. Mark, okay. and unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, the question that I had or the reason I raised my hand was I just got news an hour ago of a statewide um, curfew, not including Mono County because we're in red. I think that's probably important news to be had. Yeah, that, that did just recently come out. Dr. Boo, would you uh, be able to speak to that? Have you had time to review that order? I, I've read it quickly, but I mean, it's pretty much as, as, as Mark the caller just 
said that uh, um, the state announced today that uh, for 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 jurisdictions in the purple tier, um, there's there's basically a, a, a prohibition on uh, um, gathering outside um, a home after 10 p.m. Uh, you know, I think it's like between 10 and 5, 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. or something like that. Um, you know, so so basically saying um, um, people shouldn't be gathering in, in restaurants or, or any place else after 10 p.m. In, in counties that are in the most restrictive tier. Thank you, Dr. Boo. Can we go to our next question? Yes, our next caller is Ron. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Ron. Hi, Ron. You're, you're on mute. Ron, are you? There you go. Yes. How are you doing tonight, Ron? I'm doing good. How are you? Hanging in there, buddy. Good. I've got a question on a clarification on the nightly rental. Can an owner use the unit more than the four days that you're requiring on that? An owner, just an owner, not a guest, just an owner. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, or, or Rob Patterson, but 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 yeah, I don't think owners are restricted. No, it's not intended to um, to uh, apply to owners. No, we we cannot uh, prevent people who own homes from visiting those homes. Um, so so that's not any part of the restriction, or it's any part of your um, occupancy uh, limit that we have now. So the the latest town order does have you know occupancy limits, um, and so that does not count against that. It's really more visitation. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Dr. Boo. Let's move on to our next question. Did the base put Mono County in the more restrictive level of red? Did, did the base put us in more restrictive? Um, you know, I, I think our I think our numbers um, um, earned it themselves. You know, the, the, the state changed the way that the, the system um, by which they're assigning counties to tier, you know, as part of the uh, emergency break um, approach that uh, Stu talked about, where, where instead of requiring um, two consecutive weeks, um, which in our case would have required, you know, 15 or more cases, two consecutive weeks, you know, looking back with a, a one week lag, they went to uh, just looking at a week's worth of data with, um, with a four or five day lag in the emergency, in the, in the urgent situation that they uh, felt they were under and, and our, our case rates were too high, as was our positivity rate. We were over 5% on the positivity rate, I, I believe, without the base. And um, we do actually have uh, a representative here from Mammoth Mountain, and perhaps uh, she could give us just kind of an update on the safety features and, and what they're doing to keep everyone and all the skiers and town safe. Sure. Welcome. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Joni Lynch. I'm the VP of Marketing and Sales for uh, the ski area. And um, as you all know, we did open for the season on Friday. Um, we had Mother Nature kind of played her own part in our opening day Friday and, and brought us a, a tremendous amount of wind and um, kept our, our operations a little limited. But came the weekend, um, we saw really good visitation. Uh, we also learned a, a lot of lessons kind of about how we're going to be operating this, this, uh, this winter. I'd say for the most part, our guests were very uh, compliant in wearing masks, in social distancing, in avoiding being indoors as much as possible. Um, but from the comments that we did receive, and we received a few, what we learned that our guests want to see is a little bit more enforcement on our side in terms of making sure that we're uh, enforcing the mask zones um, and that we just have more, a stronger presence on the hill. And that's what we intend to do rolling out this weekend. Uh, we have some new areas, new signage uh, that's specific to, it's called a mask zone that's at the base of, of all of our lifts so that it's clear when a, when a skier arrives at the bottom of the lift after skiing down, that's when they need to pull their mask up. I think more often than not, our skiers were not, um, not uh, being defiant and not wearing a mask. Most of them just simply uh, hadn't pulled it up yet or had it slipped down their face. So uh, the mask zone is one thing we're doing. Um, the second thing we're doing is we're putting a COVID-19 enforcement task force out on the hill. We'll have, um, they'll have uniforms and we'll be uh, really the kind of key area where we'll be talking to our guests more frequently about pulling up their masks. Um, 
We will have people stationed at the bottom of the lifts in the between the lanes, reminding guests with a bullhorn if needed to pull up their masks. And if they choose not to comply, we actually have a fairly aggressive um, consequence now. Uh, we'll, we will be asking guests who do not feel like uh, complying with our safety protocol to leave the hill. We have a policy in place to uh, ban a guest, or take a pass or a ticket for seven days and up to an entire season if they are repeat offenders. So you'll see much more stronger enforcement out of the ski area this weekend and just really understanding the importance of safety, our part in, uh, in helping the community stay safe so we can all stay open. Thank you, Joni, and thank you for being with us here tonight. It's greatly appreciated. Can we go ahead and move to our next question? Is there an estimation on when a vaccine would become available to jurisdictions like Mono County? Sure. Um, so we should see potentially a small amount of vaccine, um, which is in phase one, which would be for uh, frontline workers. That could be as early as sometime in December, not completely sure of an exact date. But um, as far as vaccine for a larger uh, swath of, of the uh, population of our county, we anticipate that will probably be, uh, not only for us, but for most places, probably the spring. But again, um, still no confirmed dates. All right, can we have our next question? At the joint meeting, it was stated that we were most likely moving to the purple tier. Is this true? With outstanding test, what is our prognosis? So just looking at the trajectory, um, which Stu had uh, shown earlier, where we went from five cases to, I forget the exact number, was it 12 to, 20 something, and then we were at 14, but that 14 is deceptive because we don't have all those results back in yet. Um, you know, just looking at the trajectory that we were moving at, you know, it is, it is definitely a possibility that at some point uh, we would hit those kind of numbers. Um, sorry, someone's vacuuming outside my door. And um, as far as test pending, we have uh, approximately from public health about 140 tests that are still pending that were um, from this week. Would anyone like to add to that? Maybe Dr. Boo or Dr. Burroughs? Or, or not. No, there we go, Dr. Burroughs. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to add, I think at this point, and boy, this has really been the case since this all started back in March. Everyone has got to assume that absolutely everyone you come in contact with is positive. Um, this disease is highly contagious and, and really any relaxation in masking, distancing, washing is going to result in more spread. And then, yes, we will be purple. Thank you, Dr. Burroughs. Can we have our next question, please? We currently do not have any questions, Brian. Does anyone want to add? Well, why don't we go to uh, Sheriff Braun and, and Chief Davis, and they can give us some updates from, from their side of things, if they are available. They're unmuted. Well, hi. Um, this is, oh, go ahead, Al. Yeah, from uh, MLPD standpoint, there's no real change, uh, uh, no major issues that we're coming across or anything. So um, our enforcement levels are still the same. Uh, nothing's changed uh, since we changed over to the next level. So, all good. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and from the Sheriff's Office, we uh, don't have anything to report on the COVID front. We got plenty other things going on, but uh, Pretty much in the county and the unincorporated parts of the county, everything is still status quo. But moving to, to red, you know, it was a change from orange, but it's not quite purple. So it doesn't change pretty much the enforcement aspect. Thank you, Sheriff Braun, and thank you, Chief Davis. Um, we, we actually have Frank Freevolt back with us, all freshly off of vacation. He looks revitalized. You look 10 years younger, Frank. Um, any reports that you'd like to give us? I think your nose is growing there just a little bit. 
Uh, no, we continue on with uh, uh, EOC support uh, primarily for uh, public health uh, and community uh, support branches needed. Um, we are most likely going to be expanding some parts of our operation, obviously, to support uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the Walker community. Um, CEO or Lawton can address any of those questions if we have any. Uh, the want to remind everybody the sheriff's office uh, is the CIO contact for that. Um, they've been doing a great job. Uh, they're uh, the sheriffs and, and some mutual aid resources. Uh, uh, did some wonderful damage assessment work along with Mono County IT and uh, got us off to a good start. Uh, so a little bit of dual tracking right now, uh, 2020, what are you forget? Thank you, Frank. Um, Rob, would you be willing to give us a uh, update from the town? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Brian. Um, you know, kind of going back a little bit to, uh, to the challenges of changing tiers obviously that's not what we wanted to do um but that that is certainly what a community is um is, is, is lined up with but really right now within the town uh we're really ramping up the ambassador program that's part of a little bit a part of the enforcement as well as you know support for businesses and how they they're transitioning obviously this week from orange tier to red tier which has some some significant impact so um, we are ramping up from town staff's perspective. We have uh, with the ambassador program and that that's intended to go uh, where we send folks out into the field. Uh, they will visit the restaurants and the businesses and they will look at the procedures that they have set up to handle either traffic flow to handle uh, if it's a retail store um, product that's been touched and other things. Uh, but really just how things are out there what what the environment is so um, they'll educate. Uh, they will provide PPE and other um, supplies if necessary, but really it's really making sure that folks are doing what they need to be doing. Um, the other aspect of that is we have, and this is more from the EOC perspective, is we'll have uh, complaints come in about businesses and, and maybe some things that aren't, aren't being followed through on. And so we'll send people out there and, and have a face-to-face -face conversation and we'll observe what's going on and, and either correct what we see and, and, and have those discussions. And they aren't pleasant, but they are necessary in this particular environment. Um, that's sort of on the how to support the businesses and the and the um, business protocol, if you will. Um, beyond that, if you get into um, where tourists or patrons or those folks aren't really following the rules, there's good protocols in place with that. I think businesses are set to provide you know masks and require request that they use them, uh, require that they use them, and if they don't, then they can ask them to leave. Um, and if they refuse to leave, then that's that's where police and other uh, law enforcement element gets involved and, and uh, it can become a trespassing element. So I think that there's there's really a broad sense. I want to, again, to give people a, an idea. I don't want to be all negative about enforce, enforcement, but I think a lot of our act, energy and activity right now is how do we help those businesses migrate from one tier to the next and do it as, as best as possible. We know where next week is going to be very busy. Uh, and we're going to get hit with a lot of folks. So we want to be very prepared. And that's uh, the folks we're doing here at the town. Thank you, Rob. And I believe, uh, Chief Freebolt, you had something else you would like to add to the conversation? Yes, thank you, Brian. I apologize. I'd written it down as a note here and went right past it. Um, you know, as we, as we move ahead here, um, obviously in a, a period where we're seeing uh, cases rise dramatically in a lot of areas, um, we still have the basic strategies that, that all of you have proven the ability to, to use. Um, we, you know, we've had a previous spike, um, managed to it and brought that back down. Uh, we're experiencing uh, the front end of that again. Um, it, we, we, you know, we said before we can do this and we hadn't done it yet, but we we're pretty sure we could do it. Um, you've all demonstrated the ability to, as Dr. Burroughs has reminded us over again, it's so has all those emails to me, you know, distance, wash, cover. Those basic strategies are still our best bet to stay out of purple, uh, keep ourselves healthy and not have to get into a, uh, you know, more serious situation on all kinds of fronts. So as much ground as we've covered, as exciting all the discussion is about uh, vaccines, as you heard from Director Wheeler, vaccines will not change the current trajectory that we're on. It's going to be our basic behavior for distance, wash, and cover. That 
is the key to our staying out of purple and uh, keeping safe and keeping open. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, Dr. Burroughs, would you be able to give us an update from the hospital? Sure. Um, as things stands right now, we do not have any COVID patients in the hospital, but we are certainly seeing um, an increase in the number of patients that are presenting to our clinics in our emergency room with symptoms compatible with COVID. Uh, fortunately, they're not so sick that they have to be admitted at this point. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, we have seen this pattern repeatedly where when we get a surge, we get more hospitalizations. And unfortunately, we also have seen deaths as a result of, of the COVID infection. So I would remind everybody that this virus, despite the fact that we are all tired of it, the virus does not get tired. It will continue to move along as it always has. And you can see clearly that when people respond with masking and distancing and washing, the number of cases go down, the number of uh, hospitalizations go down, the number of deaths go down. This is not unique to Mammoth Lakes or Mono County or California or the United States or the world. It's the reality of what we're seeing absolutely everywhere. Um, in order to prevent us from becoming overwhelmed, it's very important that everyone does their part. That being said, the hospital has long since had plans in place to increase our surge capacity from our normal hospital census of as many as 17 inpatients, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's, where we're, that's what a critical access hospital is we have, to as many as 40, I would say comfortably, um, and we can go as high as 60 or 80 if we absolutely have to. Dr. Burroughs, can you uh, give us a little information on uh, the status of hospitals that we transfer cases to? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure people have been paying attention to the news, but Nevada to our north, which is our closest resource for transfers, is really getting impacted by the uptick in COVID cases. Renown Medical Center and Carson Tahoe, which are our two major uh, available hospitals for transfer, are both very inundated right now. They are seeing a significant increase um, and I, don't know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but as an example, if they were seeing one or two per day, they're now seeing upwards of 10, possibly 20 per day. And that's translating into more hospitalizations and more utilization of their intensive care units. So that, that being the case, the ability to transfer people out is going to be significantly less. It doesn't mean we can't take care of people, but I think most people that live here or that have ever come here understand 8,000 feet is not a small thing. Um, when you have a respiratory illness and you're at altitude, that is a impact on your ability to overcome that type of illness. So the better job we can do of preventing it from escalating to that point and impacting our neighbors to the north and for that matter to the south, the better chance we're gonna have of continuing to stay on top of this and, um, and maintain our safety and avoid a whole bunch of unavoidable, uh, unnecessary deaths, I should say. Thank you very much, Dr. Burroughs. Why don't we go back to our questions? Do we have any uh, questions? Yeah. Restaurants and retail are at 25% capacity. Does this include essential businesses like Vons, Rite Aid, or Grocery Outlet? Rob, can you answer that? As far as yeah, the I, I, perspective. I, I can take a stab at it. I was just looking at it the last day or so. so. Go, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Um, um, essential stores are, are um, apparently are expected to uh, um, reduce when, in, in the purple tier, but I, I don't, um, in, in reviewing the guidance, um, you know, last night and today with the help of some staff, there's a, there, there's a little bit of confusing stuff on the state website, but so we don't think that uh, grocery and retail, um, I mean, grocery and, and, and pharmacies um, are affected in the red tier, our, our current tier. Rob, did you want to add to that? or? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, a little bit that we will be, um, I will be work, meeting with the management of bonds in particular. I know that they're, you know, the next week should, should see a lot of opportunity for um, kind of a bit of chaos within that 
And so I just want to re reaffirm, you know, some of the policies and practices that they're using. So I do plan on meeting with them tomorrow um, for discussion on that. So just uh, just some clarity around this. That, that's part of the outreach that we're continuing with businesses. Great. Thanks, Thank Rob. you, Rob. Why don't we go to our next question? In tonight's opening presentation, it was mentioned that non-essential travel is just an advisory by the state, not a mandate. However, it seems fairly clear in the governor's order from March 19th, which is still in effect, that non-essential work slash non-urgent needs travel is not allowed. Could you please elaborate on this and give specific link locations? Thank you. Dr. Boo, can you uh, speak to this question? Well, I, I'm not sure I can speak to it definitively, but um, you know, I, I think that uh, you know the um, the the March order has been somewhat superseded by um, subsequent guidance, you know, which has softened the language and you know um, discourages travel. I mean, you know, right now, uh, I mean, CDC, the the Federal Centers for Disease Control, you know, came out with a you know recommendation um, today that uh, people don't travel for Thanksgiving and. And there is a you know a strong and clear um, recommendation from the state that that we all um, stay local, don't travel outside our region, really try to avoid um, out of state travel, and and that if we um, do choose or are forced by circumstances to uh, travel out of the region of the state, that we um, um, basically quarantine ourselves for 14 days upon returning to uh, to our to our home, um, but. But yeah, you know, and, and, and probably Sheriff Braun could also speak to this, but, um, um, you know, actual prohibitions, legal prohibitions of, of travel um, are perhaps uh, legally fraught. Um, there's some, there's some uh, you know, um, concerns about uh, violation of the U.S. Constitution, which no state can do. Um, so, so, so it's, it's an ask, it's a recommendation, it's a plea for the community to you know, think about the whole community and, and the vulnerable people and, and you know, the, the fate of, of, of the local economy and, and uh, um, yeah, hang in there and, and, and do the right thing for a while longer. Sheriff Braun, did you want to add to that? Sure, I can piggyback off of that and everything that Dr. Booth said is accurate. We cannot legally prohibit travel. We can't stop a car just to see where they're going. We don't have probable cause for that. That would be a violation of their rights. We need to have more to stop somebody from driving. So what we can do is encourage people to pay attention to the science, to listen to the smart people who say, don't travel. This is how the disease is spread is by people moving about. So don't move about, but people still need to move about. You know, you still have family members to tend to. You still need to go to the grocery store. We would. We would hope that people don't come up for Thanksgiving, but for a lot of people, it's a family tradition, and it's really hard for people to say, I can't spend Thanksgiving with my family. So it's, it's a difficult situation. We, we ask that people don't travel, but we can't make them stay home. Thank you, Sheriff Braun. Thank you, Dr. Boo. We have another question in the queue. What will moving to purple mean for the mountain operations? What would trigger a closing of the mountain? For example, a transition in the hospital status or ability to transfer critical patients? Dr. Boo, I know you've been in frequent conversations about uh, the ski resort in the town. So I'm gonna ask you to address the question. Yeah, um, th there's nothing um, currently in the state um, tier system that directly um, affects um, ski resorts, including Mammoth Mountain, um, there there is a lot of talk, a lot of activity. Um, I, I think um, in Sacramento about trying to uh, um, fix that now that ski resorts are you know are, are an important issue for a lot of jurisdictions like ours. But but right now there's nothing in the, in the state guidance, and um, locally we don't have um, um, any. Um, preconceived um, triggers that, that would, you know, um, make us um, ask the mountain to, to, to shut down. I mean, if, you know, if, if things are, you know, if we're, if we're hitting some nightmare scenario and the hospital's severely impacted and our contact tracers can't keep up, whatever, yeah, I'd, I'd probably um, be wanting to meet with the leadership of the mountain to um, see what we could do. All right, thank you, Dr. Boo. Dr. Burroughs, I see you turned off your microphone. 
Yeah, I, I would add that uh, for everyone to try to appreciate the numbers that if we were to have five hospitalized patients at one time, that relatively speaking for the size of our county and our community would be an astronomical number. Um, we have not even come close to that throughout this entire pandemic so far. So the idea that we would now have five hospitalized patients would speak to the severity of the spread of the pandemic throughout the county. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily worry so much about the number five and thinking that's not a real big number. I would think that's reflective of how severely impacted the entire region now is as a result of this virus. Thank you, Dr. Burroughs, and thank you, Dr. Boo. Let's go to that next question in the queue, please. Is there a way the website can list active cases? It's not particularly useful to know cumulative cases, including from March or April, which has long since resolved. Also, the state website used to list county hospitalizations and ICU beds, but stopped doing that. Is that something we can do on our portal? Pretty sad about the death today and no idea the county had any hospitalizations attributed to us. Lastly, sorry, these are all data questions. Are civilian still working on the Marine base and are they counted as community members or Marine base members when diagnosed on your data? All right, who'd like to speak to the portal, Stu? I can jump in. Um, so I, I think right off the base, we are not tracking active cases. Um, I, sorry, I didn't have a dog in my room. I'm thinking. <laughs> um, we're not act, tracking active cases because I think the distinction and, and the challenge there is, um, you know, what, what does COVID really mean? I mean, it, it's almost, you know, recovered. Um, are you fully recovered? I don't believe there's enough data. I'm not a public health expert. Perhaps Dr. Boo and Dr. Burroughs can jump in there, but it's not something we're tracking right now on our website. I think the question with marine bases is that we're tracking those metrics on the website. You can clearly see that we've delineated both from the county and the base. Um, and then as Dr. Boo indicated, our movement from orange to red was not from the base cases. It was from our increase in transmission throughout the county separate from the base. So uh, if uh, anybody wants to jump in after me, Dr. Burroughs, to follow up, or Dr. Boo. I apologize, those are my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, a couple of things. One, you know, the, the issue of, of sharing personal private information on patients is, is very touchy. And in a small community, especially, that it doesn't take a, a, a um, a Sherlock Holmes to figure out who we're talking about. So we have, and this has been a, a long discussed issue. We have this, we have agreed that for the sake of protecting people's identification and their personal information, we were not going to share information about people that were hospitalized in real time when they were hospitalized. We did feel it's important to reflect cases which we're doing um, and a death that have occurred as they have occurred. Uh, I apologize for that. I know people would like to know everything about everyone at every minute, but I, I really feel like it's in, it, it's in everyone's best interest, for certainly patients and families, not to divulge what's going on in real time. Uh, I think that's just a reality we have to face. That's more important than the community knowing that. I think this pandemic has been going on long enough now that looking at the county website and Gleaning from that, that the death's gone from one to two to three is enough to say, wow, we're still in the middle of this and, and we've had deaths. Um, and same thing for the case rate. You can tell from day to day that we're seeing an increase in cases. I don't think you really need or frankly are entitled to have personal information about people that are in the hospital dealing with whatever they're dealing with, no matter what their condition is. Thank you, Dr. Burroughs. Chief Rebolt, I see your microphone's off. Were you looking to add to the conversation? Uh, yes, please. A, a, a little let, less clinical consideration too is um, you've heard different versions of us uh, describing how quickly uh, the virus can spread, how contagious it is. 
uh, what a small number of people it would take to put a real strain on our, um, our health care system. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we really don't have the capacity, even if we could, track that information because uh, our public health team, who's been doing a great job, uh, will completely be maxed out on the contact tracing portion, which is our number one strategy, the, the, the ability to um, contain, uh, if possible, through uh, active testing, contact tracing, um, and we're maxed out at that level. That's, that's where we're at on resources. And so we, even, if, even if there were definitions and we could get around uh, the privacy aspect, um, want to be clear, we, we are very thin on resources. And so this plea to uh, distance, wash, and cover, as, as uh, monotonous as it may sound, uh, it, it is the first and best strategy. Um, so, so please, as our healthcare professionals give guidance in that direction, um, it is, it, it, we just don't have a lot of room left. So please, please help us out in that area uh, for all those different reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Why don't we uh, go back to the questions in the queue? Sorry, again, do, how do you record civilians working on the base? Are they community members or marine base members in the data? Actually, I believe they're, um, well, I wanna be careful about how I answer it to not uh, divulge any personal information, but um, it, it there, there has been no real spillover into the community. I'll just kind of leave it at that. All right, and, and, and you know, um, this is Tom Blue again, and, and um, I think there's a couple of different sort of um, aspects um, to that. Um, so, graphically, you know, on our, on our on our portal, you know, we're trying to show cases that are directly associated with with the. Out, outbreak on the on the mountain warfare training center um, and separating those out but um, as, as a matter of fact um, you know I, I happen to just speak to, to one of the medical officers the public health officer on the base this evening and he said things have been real quiet that the large unit that brought the you know the the, the problem with them um, you know from out of state they, they they've left the area and they don't have any um, evidence of um disease um you know among their permanent personnel related to the outbreak they, they are seeing you know um some occasional cases just from community transmission and and, and but but the, but the rules for you know what counts you know officially as a mono county case again certainly resident um personnel whether active duty or or um civilian um who, who live in mono county you know, even if they're living behind, you know, the, 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 the fences or the base of the housing complex or whatever, they, they would count. But, but as we learned in the, in the outbreak, um, even um, trainees who had been here over longer than 14 days um, in the state's current system would count um, toward, towards Mono counties. So, so that was the reason we did the adjudication request um, to the state. And, you know, I, I do think that's the reason we did not end up in the, in the, in the in the, in the purple tier um, this week is because the state accepted our argument that uh, you know what was what was happening um, on the marine base that was driving our, our numbers up so fast was was not reflective of, of what's going on um, outside the, the marine base community. Sorry, that was a, a long answer, but uh, it, it's it's kind of a complex issue. Thank you, Dr. Vu. We'll ask for our next question out of the queue. If the virus is so contagious, is it safe to be in confined spaces with others, such as elevators, lifts, small offices, et cetera? Are there no. specific <laughs> regarding those areas? No, Dr. Vu, go ahead. Sure, you know, um, um, I think it depends, you know, so, so, so we all do have a much um, better appreciation now for, um, for the um, capacity of this virus to um, sp spread, you know, sort of um, by, by what we, you know, refer to as the airborne route, you know, when, when it first started, um, there, was a, there was a working assumption based on the patterns of people who are getting sick that, uh, you know, um, it, it was kind of like this direct spray or ballistic um, um, 
droplet transmission is, is is a term that I've I've seen used where you know you had to be sort of in a in the in the in the line of fire of somebody sneezing, coughing, or as we learned later, talking or or or, or, or singing. But but clearly um, that's not the case. Um, that that uh, you know if uh, if you're in a confined space with somebody or too close to to somebody um, who is um, actively um, shedding a lot of virus, um, you're, you're at risk. So, so the, the the small space issue that, that you raise is very real. Let me let me pause for one second for for Teresa. She's amazing, but uh, she's translating. <laughs> That's a, um, um, but you know, I, I think I think it depends a lot. You know, so so like I, um, my understanding, what I have read, I'm no expert on ventilation, but that but that you know, modern elevators have actually very good um, v ventilation and air exchange. And, and so, you know, um, five, six weeks ago, I was in a, in, a, in a hospital in the Reno area and, you know, and I got in, a, in, in an elevator and I was thinking, hmm, uh, I don't feel very good about this. I was by myself, um, but, you know, other people had just gotten out. Um, but then subsequently, I, you know, I, I read that, uh, that elevators have, have very good air exchange. And, you know, I was wearing, a, you know, I think an, even an N95, um, so, so, um, so I, I feel better about elevators, but um, I would be very careful about any um, confined space. Um, you know, certainly with other people present, but even um, for a period of time after after people have left. And and but the question about whether there's posting on the on the you know um, around those spaces, I know that's not something we've um, we 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 thought to do at this point. So. All right. Thank you, Dr. Boo. And Avoid those confined spaces. Let's go back to the questions in the queue. Outdoor dining is best without walls to prevent spread. What is the current practice for outdoor dining? Dr. Boo? Right, so um, the, the state um, guidance um, since, you know, for, 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 for many months since they made the distinction between outdoor and indoor dining um, is that, um, a restaurant is only allowed to have um, a single wall. Um, you know, it, it's basically, you know, it's a roof with, with one wall is all that uh, restaurants are, are currently allowed to uh, to have for outdoor dining, which is, you know, it, 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 it's challenging um, for, for cold climates. Indeed, indeed. And it's uh, just beginning, the winter is just beginning. I don't even think we're in winter. I think we're still in fall, aren't we? <laughs> All right, let's go to the queue for our next question. If me or my family travel for Thanksgiving, what precautions should we take before, during, and after? I'm gonna ask Dr. Burroughs to answer this one. Well, the easy and unpopular answer is don't travel. Um, that's following the state mandate to not do any essential travel. That being said, I, I don't think any of us are kidding ourselves when we know that people are going to travel for Thanksgiving. Um, certainly the idea of not having a massive gathering is going to be helpful. So the recommendation has been not more than 12 people or three families and to do it outdoors preferentially. Um, I think anything you can do to avoid gathering in areas where you know you're going to encounter people. So if you're planning on traveling somewhere and then you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy all of your Thanksgiving supplies along with the rest of the free world that is going to do the same thing is putting yourself at risk. So um, masking at all times, maintaining that six foot distance, not planning on gathering people you don't know. Um, and, I, and this is some somewhat loose recommendations Obviously, the strict recommendations I already said, but planning to be with people you know and what they've been doing and what their practices have been is certainly going to be better than, hey, my friend and his family are going to join us and how about we all get together as opposed to the family that you know has been following all the guidelines you've been following is going to put yourself at least in a position where you know what you're getting into. Uh, I would also strongly recommend that if you don't feel well, if you have any symptoms, please avoid going in the first place. And certainly if you're already in the process of traveling, that's when you've got to isolate yourself. You've got to stay removed from other people. 
That doesn't mean stay in the house with them. That literally means put yourself in a room all by yourself, close the door and don't have anything to do with anybody. Um, I say that because that's realistically what's going to happen and not because anyone's going to be able to mandate don't get in your car, don't travel, don't have Thanksgiving with friends and family because we know that's going to happen to some extent. Uh, I think there's safe ways to do it and there are not safe ways to do it. All right, thank you, Dr. Burroughs. And yes, I see Chief Rebolt, you have a couple items you'd like to add. Just quickly to add to that, um, you know, by their nature, the holidays is an opportunity for us to get together with uh, family is what we're talking about. And, you know, what we've really learned, there's no doubt about it, is that uh, our older populations or people with pre-existing conditions are at a much higher rate than the rest of us. And so you know, when you're making those decisions, um, a lot of times we are seeing some elderly family members as part of that process or part of the family. And make no mistake, they are at a much higher risk, um, you know, maybe some of the younger members in the family. So even with all of the precautions that Dr. Burroughs is addressing there, you know, it, 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 it's a real bummer not to be able to spend, you know, holidays with family. Um, the only thing that was worse was to be to you know that they're in the hospital shortly thereafter, you know, and um, it's a, again, these aren't fun conversations to have, but um, that's our experience with this thing. So please think it through. Absolutely. And, and Chief Freebolt, um, I saw you put in a note to me about a reminder about working remotely in the red tier. Um, and that is actually one of the things in the red tier. If you're an office worker um, and not an essential worker, that you should work remotely if at all possible. Um, that is definitely something that is in the red tier. It'll help cut down on potential spread in work sites. So that uh, that is some good advice to follow. And maybe, yeah, maybe you got to scrape your car a little bit less. I don't, I don't know, but um, <laughs> we've all gotten pretty good at uh, remote items. And so, you know, uh, be mindful that can be one of those small spaces where we get some, get some spread. Thank Absolutely. You. Stu, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we were keeping up with our translator, but uh, the EOC, Emergency Operations Center, will be providing an updated gathering uh, press release. So look for that um, tomorrow on the portal. Look for that in our and your most popular favorite uh, printed newspaper throughout Mona County and the town of Mammoth Lakes. Look for that on our COVID portal. Look for that on our social media site. So again, we just want to reiterate the importance um, and the risk of gatherings indoors, right? There's some recommendations in there, like Dr. Burroughs mentioned and Chief Freebolt, Dr. Boo, about how you mitigate those. But again, the we can't make Thanksgivings and gatherings um, safe, right? Clearly, they're not a safe event. So we're just going to be providing uh, some recommendations. But again, I think you've heard it from the panel this year that now more than ever, um, now is not the time to gather indoors. So thank you. Thank you again, Stu. And it uh, looks like we would have time for one more question if we have any in the queue. What COVID precautions are in place for those at the temporary evacuation point? Well, that's a good question. I was up there just yesterday. Um, the, basically, the, we are, um, people are, are quar not quarantining, but um, they are being placed in hotel rooms by family. Um, there's no real mixing. Um, and basically, you know, people are encouraged to wear masks, of course, that's a requirement and to maintain distance. So, you know, most into like all the individuals are in family units in rooms and um, that should uh, prevent spread as long as people abide by that. Would anyone Brian, like to? I can help to answer that if you'd like. Certainly. So it's a temporary evacuation point. It's not a shelter. We are not sheltering. It's not like a bunch of cots set up in a room. People are given vouchers for hotel rooms. When they come out of their car, they wear a mask. They come, they check in, they're given a voucher. They stay with their family pods. There is no mixing of population. Thank you, Chief Braun. Much appreciated. Or Sheriff Braun, I'm sorry. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, that kind of looks like we are out of time for tonight. Um, do appreciate everyone being here with us on this Thursday evening. And I do wish everyone a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. 
Um, remember, Zoom's a, a great way to connect with your family on the holidays. So until we meet again, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night, Mono County.